Calling for Wolves is asking Minnesotans to respect our true wildlife manager, the wolf. Their survival is critical to our ecosystems, our communities, and even our economy. As highly intelligent animals with strong social bonds, Minnesota wolves deserve to be protected and admired. Learn more at howlingforwolves.org. Let's live and let howl. For too long, American Indian tribes have faced a competitive disadvantage when litigating against powerful forces. With its American Indian law and policy practice, Robbins Kaplan LLP seeks to redefine excellence for high-stakes litigation in Indian country. They have worked hand-in-hand with tribes to implement the Tribal Law and Order Act, fighting against diminishment of tribal lands and natural resources, and improving public safety on reservations. The Robbins Kaplan American Indian Law and Policy Practice serves tribes and individuals on commercial, government investigations, agency and tribal boundary disputes, as well as personal injury. Founded and led by former United States attorneys Brendan Johnson and Tim Purden, their American Indian law and policy practice exists to bring justice to tribal clients whose claims in the past have been dismissed or ignored due to their underdog status. If you or your tribe are facing legal issues, contact RobbinsKaplan.com or call toll-free at 1-800-553-9910. Hey, Cudigy to all my friends and relatives in four directions. This is Robert Pilot of Native Roots Radio Presents I'm Awake. I'm here to ask you for your support. Finding honest, Native-centered news is not easy. But with your support, we're able to provide accurate information about Standing Rock, Line 3, treaty violations, and COVID-19 in our Native communities. Please visit Native Roots Radio Network on Patreon and donate if you can. That's Native Roots Radio Network on Patreon. Pinigigi, and thank you for your support. Hey, Ogama, I've been hearing a lot about this term, climate justice. What is that? Climate justice is recognizing that the negative impacts of climate change don't affect all people equally. It also means transitioning from a fossil fuel-based economy to a more sustainable future. MN350 is one of the groups that's pushing for this transition to protect our futures. You can even get involved, too. That's great, especially since I'm concerned about pipeline projects like Line 3. How can I help MN350? Just find them on Facebook or visit MN350.org. With a look at your AM 950 weather, I'm Patrick Lulia. Cloudy tonight with a low of 7 below, wind chills around 15 below. Then cloudy on Friday with a high of 10, lowest wind chills around 15 below. The locally owned vinaigrette has been offering the finest olive oils and vinegar since 2009. That's Vinaigrette, Xerxes Avenue and 50th Street in Minneapolis or at vinaigrettemn.com. Portions of Native Roots Radio may be pre recorded. It's a good day to be indigenous. Get up, stand up. They are going to become more brutal. Cody Cup, Hemi Cup, Because all the hippies are trying to be Indians anyway. They're going to become more repressive because it's a matter of dollars and their illusionary concepts of power. Hey, Victor. We must live in balance with the earth. And also with recent happenings at Wounded Knee. I am awake. Welcome to Native Roots Radio Presents I'm Awake, and I'm your host, Wakanja Hade. Hey, Kadagi, to all my friends and relatives in four directions, you are listening to Native Roots Radio Presents. I'm awake, and I'm your, I'm your host, Robert Pilot. That's my colonized name and taxpayer name, and I'm here with Wendy Pilot, and we discuss local and national Native news and events, and as you know, Wendy, Native issues are human issues, and human issues are Native issues. This portion of the show is brought to you by Alliant Energy, powering beyond. Hey, without any further ado, we got a jam-packed day of, of news. Why don't we get with Ogama with the news? Buju Anin, everybody. I am Ogama Ganuakwe. I am from the Red Lake Nation in northern Minnesota, and I reside in central Minnesota now. My name means Strong Golden Eagle Woman, and I'm here with some news for you on Native Roots Radio. As always, I like to start a little bit closer to home with regional and uh, local news. So last night, uh, and we've been talking about it quite a bit here on Native Roots Radio, last night was the Wisconsin DNR hearing on the draft environmental impact statement for the Line 5 pipeline reroute in northern Wisconsin. Wisconsin Public Radio did release some news of what happened last night, and I just want to say that uh, I was a part of that last night as well, and it was a long meeting. Uh, Nearly 300 people attended the 10-hour-long virtual public hearing on yesterday, Wednesday, about the draft environmental 
review for the $450 million plan to reroute the Line 5 oil pipeline across northern Wisconsin. In December, the Wisconsin DNR released its draft environmental impact statement for the roughly 40-mile reroute of Embridge's Line 5 in Ashland and Iron Counties. The pipeline is being rerouted off of the Bad River Reservation in northern Wisconsin as the Bad River Tribe has requested and um, sued the company in 2019 to shut down and remove Line 5 from the tribe's reservation. The pipeline carries about 23 million gallons of oil and natural gas liquids per day and spans 645 miles from Superior, Wisconsin to Sarnia, Ontario. The company's new 30-inch line is expected to cross nearly 200 water bodies, excuse me, and temporarily affect 135 acres of wetland in northern Wisconsin. Enbridge maintains the currently nearly 70-year-old pipeline as a vital link for fuel across the region, they claim. However, most people last night spoke in opposition to the reroute during the hearing, and it stretched all the way into the early morning hours of Thursday. Some supporters of the project, of course, including Republican lawmakers, labor unions, and business lobbyists touted that there would be some 700 construction jobs that would be created during the project and also highlighted a uh, economic impact supposedly of $135 million for the state as well as uh, income from property tax revenues that the company's pipeline would generate. However, the project is ex is expected to include blasting and drilling at 139 wetlands and waterways to install the pipeline. The review also identified federal and state endangered species around the project, as well as high quality waterways and wetlands. Uh, the Kekagon and the Bad River Sloughs, which comprise 16,000 acres of internationally recognized wetlands, are homes to the largest wild rice bed on the Great Lakes, and it is downstream from this project. Enbridge is still going to have to obtain permits from multiple state and federal agencies, and the DNR is still currently accepting public comment for the project through Friday, March 18th. You can submit public comment in writing to the Wisconsin DNR by going to the Wisconsin DNR website. In more national news uh, from The Guardian, Native American tribes have reached a $590 million settlement over opioids de devastation. The filing involves Johnson & Johnson and three other big distributors as the Attorney General for eight states and D.C. are set to close the deal with Purdue Pharma. If you're not familiar, Purdue Pharma, run by the Sackler family, uh, was facing charges back in, I think, 2007 or so for the deaths of nearly 500,000 Americans. Americans after falsely advertising their product OxyContin as non-addictive. They are still being charged in these cases uh, as they filed bankruptcy and the family themselves were not forced to pay any significant amounts of money. So that is still going on um, in eight states and D.C. They're waiting to close that deal to pursue further financial damages from Purdue Pharma. However, the filing that benefits the Native American tribes uh, was filed in Cleveland and it lays out details of settlements with Johnson & Johnson and Amerisource Bergen Cardinal Health and McKesson. All federally recognized tribes will be able to participate in the settlements even if they did not sue over opioids and many tribes have been hit hard by this addiction and overdose crisis. We all know that so many people in our communities are affected by this opioid use. Some companies are nearing the final stages of approval of settlements uh, worth about $26 billion with state and local governments across the U.S. So this is a big deal uh, that Native Americans are going to be able to get um, a slice of some of these funds that are available. However, we all know that it will not bring back the loved ones that were lost due to the opioid crisis and those that we continue to lose on a regular basis. So I want to make sure that everybody knows that our prayers are out for our relatives that are struggling with addiction right now. Um, we're with you. Uh, land back news from California from kqed.org. There is a conservation group that represents Northern California tribes and they have been able to reclaim a big swath of the redwood forest along the coastline in Northern Mendocino County of California. The San Francisco based Save the Redwoods League uh, bought the remote 523 acre plot and 
announced that they are transferring the ownership back to the intertribal uh, Sinkioni Wilderness Council or Sinkioni Council, which includes members of 10 federally recognized tribes in Mendocino and Lake Counties. The Sinkioni call the land Se I Lidon, meaning fish run place, and it's located about 170 miles north of San Francisco in the traditional territory of the Sinkioni people, and it includes about 200 acres of old growth redwood trees, which were miraculously spared by loggers along with uh, Second growth groves, uh, Douglas firs, tan oaks, and mandrones. Uh, the forest is also habit inhabited by a number of threatened species. As part of the transfer, the council has agreed to a conservation easement and a covenant guaranteeing the ongoing protection of the land. So wonderful, wonderful news there. And then quick news from across the ocean and from Indian country today. Congratulations go out to Indigenous or Aboriginal Australian Ash Barty, who is a Garigo woman, who is the first Australian women's singles tennis champion uh, since 1978 and was the first Australian player to reach the finals since 1980. Uh, Barty is now or now has Grand Slam singles titles on three different types of surfaces. So apparently tennis you can play on different surfaces. Um, she won the hard court at Melbourne Park, grass at Wimbledon last year, and clay at the 2019 French Open. She now joins Serena Williams as the only active players on the women's tour for tennis with majors one on all three different types of surfaces. Uh, Yvonne Google Google Gulagon, excuse me, Cauley, who is a tennis icon with seven Grand Slam singles titles and a trailblazer for Indigenous athletes from Australia, was a surprise guest to present the champion's trophy to Ash Barty. And Ash Barty is now a part of the new generation of Indigenous sports stars. So thank you, uh, everybody, for tuning in to Native Roots Radio. I want to remind you to uh, like and share the stream, and we will see you more tomorrow. Wow, that was awesome, uh, Wendy. That was Ogama with the news. Excellent. She always does such a great job with so much good information all over Turtle Island. Perfect. Yeah, we uh, appreciate her and all she brings to the show. Up next, uh, we have Robert Lilligren, uh, CEO of a Native American Community uh, Development Institute here in the Twin Cities. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. JNS Bean Factory is a native owned, community supported, cozy, artsy coffee shop which offers roasted on site beans, live music, and baked goods. Relax in the beautiful outside patio. City Pages writes, voted top 10 coffee shops. Tucked into a quiet corner of St. Paul's Highland Park neighborhood, this coffee shop roasts beans on site from the best coffee growing countries in the world. Located at 1518 Randolph Avenue, St. Paul. The good stuff. Bougie relatives, my name is Deanna Standing Cloud. I'm from the Red Lake Nation and I live in Minneapolis today. As the weather gets colder, you're probably going to spend more time indoors, but it's important to stay safe and healthy. The COVID-19 pandemic is still not over, and now the flu season is upon us. So protect you and your loved ones by getting vaccinated against both the flu and COVID-19. COVID booster shots have now been approved for Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. And you're eligible if you're over 65 and if you're over 18 and have underlying health conditions or work in a high-risk setting. What's cool is your booster shot does not need to be of the same brand as your original series of shots. And you can receive a booster shot of any brand that's available to you. Children over the age of five are now eligible for a vaccine as well. So let's protect our relatives in Indian country this winter and get vaccinated. Be a vaccinative like me. Find a vaccination site by calling 651-304-9986 or visit vaccineconnector.mn.gov. Miigwech, Bizindawian. When we heal from our traumas. When we face our fears. Let go of our addictions. When we relearn our values. When we live our teachings. Respecting our elders. Cherishing and honoring our children. When we honor and take care of our spirit, there will be no room left for sexual violence. Sponsored by the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition.
You're listening to Native Roots Radio. This is Spirit from Reservation Dogs. Get up and listen. Welcome back to Native Roots Radio presents I'm Awake and this is Robert Pilot. This portion of the show is brought to you by MN350, a grassroots organization fighting for climate justice. Hey, Wendy, I was just watching that uh, Reservation Dogs again. Uh, you know, these 20, 22 minute shows uh, just fly. Yeah. Uh, what a lot What a lot of heart uh, that show has. Mm-hmm. It sure does. I'd like to rewatch it as well. Hey, before we get with uh, Robert Lilligren, I just want to, I got to text this, uh, and I don't want to play this right now, but officially Leonard is on the POTUS's radar. President uh, Biden um, has listened to a former chief judge um, and Kevin Sharp, Leonard's lawyer. Uh, judge Sharp will show all why it is a must for America, most especially Native Americans, to heal. And that would be healing and bringing Leonard home after being uh, in prison for far over 45 years as a political prisoner, uh, longest standing. I mean, they even have uh, the person who shot Reagan and John Lennon are out, you know, and, and it's just an amazing, amazing thing. Um, but uh, f- without further ado, let's get with uh, Robert Lilligren of the Native American uh, Community Development Institute here in the Twin Cities. And we'd like to uh, catch up and talk local and national politics. So I don't know, maybe your thoughts on Free Leonard, uh, we can get going on that maybe. Yeah, thanks. Bonjour, Wendy. Bonjour, Robert. Nice to be. Oh, we uh, somehow lost lost you. you. We can't hear you. Maybe you should text him, Robert, because we can't uh, hear him and let him know something might have happened with his headset or his computer or something might have went wrong. Uh, Every now and then we have some uh, technical difficulties and, uh, well, we get through it and we do our best uh, to figure it out and we kind of move along and just go ahead. Um, Just go ahead. Ooh, that was weird. Sounded like I was possessed there and I am not possessed. I don't really know what's going on. Um, Later in the show, I'm going to be talking about the Mexican gray wolf uh, and their plight and what's going on with the Mexican gray wolf. Um, They also live in other places other than Mexico. I'm sure you already know that. Uh, But that's what I'll be talking uh, about later on in the show. Let's see if Robert uh, can check in here. Can you, can you oh. hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yeah, thanks, you guys. Sorry, I've been having audio issues all day with my computer. Yeah, no problem. We have problems kind of, every day, practically. Yeah, so I'm here. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, no problem. So, hey, uh, as I started out the show a little bit, or not the show, but the segment talking about Leonard Peltier and um, just your thoughts. Um you know, long, 45 years, is that too long? Or, you know, for somebody that really, you know, I don't know. It's, 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 we talk about free and loud your Peltier every show at the end. Right. Uh, as you know, Robert, uh, what are your thoughts to start the show off? Yeah, no, I'm glad you did. And I don't know if you heard me before. I said, it's about time. You know, uh, I think you were saying, or maybe Wendy was saying, it's on the president's radar. There's some response and, you know, as I said, uh, maybe the last show or a couple shows ago, I was very surprised at the end of the Obama administration that President Obama didn't pardon him. It just seemed like such a a good thing for him to do, a natural fit. So, so you know, fingers crossed. And hopefully, uh, to your question, Robert, I think 45 years is too long here. So, yeah, hopeful. Yeah. I- yeah, we're very hopeful, and that's going to be a big push here for us on Native Roots Radio. It's uh, 46 years is way too long. It's heartbreaking. Um, you know, send out the emails to Kamala and Biden, um, and they want to hear from us. So, uh, hey, I, I saw something on Facebook, Robert, that you mentioned, and I don't know if you want to get too deep into this, but there was a life-changing event in your life. and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and um, do you mind talking about that? Uh, no, not at all. Although I will say thanks for asking because, you know, I do talk about it from time to time. And, uh, you know, and it's kind of a happy ending story or all's well. But it does kind of bring up that the same kind of physical trauma and stuff. And sometimes they get kind of emotional 
talking about it. And I just, you know, I ran across that old photo and I thought, oh, it's Thursday. I'll put it up on Facebook. But yeah, back in 1998, I was in a motorcycle accident, you know, where I should have died. I mean, it was, you know, I wasn't wearing a helmet and a car ran a red light and you know, it was heading to collide with me. And it was the most amazing experience. And, you know, I, I survived, obviously, and I had very minor injuries. I had like 36 breaks in my hand and my thumb joints had to be wired back together. And other, otherwise, I just had a couple scrapes and bruises, but it was just transformational in my life. And, you know, I was kind of this grassroots community activist guy, block club leader. You know, I had my a few buildings I was renovating on the same all on the same block in Phillips. And I thought, okay, you know, I was approaching 40. I thought, okay, this is this is my life and you know, I'm fine with it. I'm I'm satisfied, you know, doing some good in the world and stuff. But then after this uh accident, it just it had a profound impact just on my whole approach. You know, I, I kinda at the time thought, you know, that was one of the worst things that could happen to me and I survived. <laughs> and it was tremendously empowering. And after, after that happens, you know, doing things like standing in front of a crowd of people, you know, and making a fool out of yourself doesn't seem quite so scary. Right. So I was so much more willing to take risks and, and move in. And it really was sort of a first step in my path to running for public office and having a public career. And, and it was amazing. It was, yeah, it was an incredible experience. Have yeah. you ever faced anything like that, Robert? Any sort of that life, you know, life-threatening where pr your perspective changes? You know, well, I think uh, quitting drinking 37 ah. years ago, doing drugs, and it's been a slow process for me to uh, to awaken. But uh, it's interesting. I, I I I sent something to Wendy, and I don't know, if, Wendy, if you want to chime in, that uh, and it really made sense. It was kind of about people really kicking it in when they're 60 and 70 years old. Do you remember that article, Wendy? I do. Yeah. That said, like when you get, get into your sixties or seven seventies, then when people really kick it in, cause I think that they realize that, Hey, I don't have enough, I don't have a lot of time left. And if I want to do something, I really got to get going. So yep. that's what you're kind of doing, you know, Robert. Yeah. yeah kind of. Not kinda. Robert Pilot, not Robert Lilligren. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but you too. <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I think that's part of it. But also, you know, I think it said something like Pulitzer Prize winners or uh, average ages are 70 years old, you know, things like that, um, uh, that people are getting acknowledged and CEOs and there's presidents. 60, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. Presidents. I mean, we're, we're baby boomers. We remember Kennedy or remember of Kennedy, who was 43. And then ever since then, I think uh, uh, Carter was at a decent age, but Reagan uh, was an old man when he got in, and now it's been a, a big trend. I mean, Obama broke the trend, but right. uh, it's been a yeah. big trend of older people. Obama was the first president that was younger than me. So, uh, you know, yeah. like, oh, okay, things are a little different now. And uh, we always joke, uh, Robert, uh, I, I put this I put this uh, mem up that it's the same time from 1970 to 1917, oh, yeah. Yeah. and and in same regards too. I know I'm going off off a tangent here, but Kennedy was the first president that was born in the 20th century, which sure. really blows my mind too. Yeah. And then you talk about Obama, who was born what in 61 or 60? I think 61 or 62. Um, he's the same age as me, and yeah, time flies. But it's really interesting that that. Uh, uh, things do happen like you're uh, kicked in and you're li just a little older than Wendy and I, but uh, I have too. And I think when you do what you like to do and you position your life into doing that, it's not work. Truly, truly. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's funny before that, you know, before my political life and stuff, I was a bartender for 20 years, you know, and did a lot of um, you know, grassroots kind of organizing and things. And then I had my little housing operation in my my block in Phillips, you know. And uh, and the my life now is so different. You know, it's never, now that, and you know how it is, I, I'm about a year older than you, but as you get older, you have more perspective, right? You can look back over more years and start seeing these patterns and, 
that's one of the reasons I made that post about the motorcycle accident is because now that I have more perspective, I can see that most of the important uh, sort of directions, things in my life are really unexpected, almost like accidents or just really sudden shifts in my, um, in my life uh, condition and things. And, and so I've never been one of those people that had this plan. I'm going to go point to point to point. It's like you wake up every morning. It's like, what door am I going through today? Exactly. <laughs> Things come to you. Yeah, it's it's really, really interesting um, being at this age. I think one of the things for me, and that's part of being in recovery, and I know I don't talk a lot about, about it a lot on our show, but, um, you know, when there's a crisis, you know, no one and I talked about this. It's a, uh, it's a uh, Chinese word. They merged the two symbols, dangerous win and opportunity. Every crisis is a dangerous opportunity. And also, um, I don't have anything to lose. And and if people, you ask what happened, well, if nobody died, then it's okay. We can move forward. You know, right. we made a mistake. Yeah. And th those are the perspectives that uh, I think you're talking about. At least, you know, I know I am because I don't sweat the small stuff. And let me tell you, when I was young, <laughs> I sweat the small stuff. All the time. Yeah. yeah but I was talking hey. to my sister-in-law last week, and she was... And she's saying she's she's got a lot of life changes and stuff, and she needs to kind of get over things. And I was telling her about getting over fear, and she goes, "Well, how did you do it? I want to get over my fear." And I was like, "You don't want to do it how I did it. I almost died. I'm sure there are easier ways." Well, hey, stay with us, Robert, if you can. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Native Ritz Radio presents. I'm awake. Stay with us. Hey, Wendy, what are we doing for dinner after the show? How about we go to Jay Selby's on 169 Victoria Street in St. Paul. They have a delicious plant-based menu that's compassionate and environmentally sustainable. I'm getting their spot-on vegan Big Mac, the dirty secret. You can pick up and they deliver within a five-mile radius, or you can call them at 651-222-3263 or visit jayselbys.com. Well, you sold me one. Let's go order at Jay Selby's tonight. I'm hungry. Navigating COVID while protecting yourself can be difficult. Fortunately, there's a hotline you can call with any questions. The Department of Indian Work St. Paul partnered with the Minnesota Department of Health to open the Twin Cities American Indian COVID-19 hotline. They provide information on vaccines, booster shots, and testing sites. Right now, booster shots are available to anyone over the age of 18 for those who are eligible. The Twin Cities American Indian COVID-19 hotline can also help with housing, food, medical, and educational support. If you or someone you know has questions about COVID-19, vaccinations, booster shots, or testing, please call 651-304-9986. Again, the number is 651-304-9986. The Twin Cities American Indian COVID-19 hotline is open for calls Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Call the Twin Cities American Indian COVID-19 hotline at 651-304-9986. Hi, I'm Anna and I'm 8 years old and I'm getting my COVID vaccine. If you're between 5 and 11 years old, you can get vaccinated too. Getting the jab might seem a little scary, but there is lots of good reasons to do it. You'll be protected from COVID, and you'll be less likely to spread it to people like family and friends. Have your parents find a vaccination site by calling 651-304-9986 or visit vaccineconnector.mn.gov. Hey, Olgama, I've been hearing a lot about this term, climate justice. What is that? Climate justice is recognizing that the negative impacts of climate change don't affect all people equally. It also means transitioning from a fossil fuel-based economy to a more sustainable future. MN350 is one of the groups that's pushing for this transition to protect our futures. You can even get involved, too. That's great, especially since I'm concerned about pipeline projects like Line 3. How can I help MN350? Just find them on Facebook or visit mn350.org. Hey, Tom Harbin here, and you can catch me live every weekday from 11 to 2 following the Stephanie Miller Show right here on AM 950, the progressive voice of Minnesota. All across the nation, we are here for our communities. We're doing our part to get supplies where it's needed in order to fight COVID-19 together. It feels good to be out there to assist our community. I would like our friends and family to know that your National Guardsmen are always ready and always there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. Sponsored by the Minnesota Army National Guard. Aired by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association and this station. 
Turn to Auto Technical with your vehicle donation. We have families waiting for a car. You know, over 85% of unemployed are successful in finding and keeping a job if they have dependable transportation. A car plus a job equals a life changed. 612-919-5526. We have families waiting for a car. 919-5526 or autotech.org. With a look at your AM 950 weather, I'm Patrick Lulia. Cloudy tonight with a low of 7 below, wind chills around 15 below. Then cloudy on Friday with a high of 10, lowest wind chills around 15 below. The locally owned Vinaigrette has been offering the finest olive oils and vinegar since 2009. That's Vinaigrette, Xerxes Avenue and 50th Street in Minneapolis or at vinaigrettemn.com. Hi, I'm Jane Fonda, and you're listening to Native Roots Radio. And we're back to Native Roots Radio Presents. I'm awake, and this is Robert Pilot. This portion of the show is brought to you by the Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. Wow. Hey, we're here with uh, Robert Lilligren, and Robert's with uh, Native uh, American uh, Community Development Institute uh, in here in uh, Minneapolis in the Twin Cities. And we're always, uh, it's fun. We always just kind of have a conversation. And whenever I think of you, uh, Robert, I kind of think uh, about what I go through in my other job, and I really don't talk much about that either. And that's um, trying to meet people where they're at. And that's a, that's a skill and that's something that's almost, it's easier said than done. <laughs> what are your thoughts on what? Oh, yours. I, I mean, you talk people yeah. all the time. Yeah, you just said a mouthful, right? And, uh, you know, I, sometimes they joke, you know, community community engagement would be easier if all these people weren't involved in it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I am a grassroots organizer kind of guy, so whether it's, you know, planning a community event or trying to pass a policy, it's always to me about bringing the people to the table, more and more people to the table. And it gets messy, right? And it's harder and sometimes than not bringing people to the table, but that's true movement building. And so, uh, yeah, I just had a conversation about this earlier today, Robert, as we're planning to go out and refresh our American Indian community blueprint that NACTI helped convene about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. So we've done We've done an evaluation now it's to go out into the community and uh, and it's easy to say meet people where they are right but communities are complicated ours is particularly complicated so that means you know how do we capture the the visions of the unsh- of our unsheltered relatives you know that's a that takes a special kind of effort you know we don't we certainly don't expect people to come to some kind of meeting town hall meeting you know, we, we'll go where you are. We'll go where you are and capture your your dreams, your hopes, your visions for this vision document. But but it can be messy, and you know, and I'm still in government, as you guys know, and so uh, I'm in our regional government. I'm a representative there, and and uh, and so there's a lot of community engagement, community involvement. I represent some of the most um, uh, lower wealth and most high percentage of people of color. Uh, communities in the in the city in the region and so that's another again a special effort needs to be made to engage people who are busy trying to live day to day and you know feed their kids and work three jobs and you know they're not going to come to a meeting or fill out a survey and so so this is something and then at NACTI we're a community engagement organization so it's, it's something we grapple with every day it's hard because I know when we uh first did uh, not did but when the uh, for wall of forgotten natives uh first happened and there was a lot of community and there was a lot of things that needed to be smoothed out too and i mean in a good way so some people you know come come into this uh service with ideas of possible glory and making a name for themselves and then there's other people that you never hear of uh that do do what 90 percent of the work <laughs> Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And then sort of one of the the tricks, the strategies of community engagement, community organizing is finding the people who have those big spheres of influence who aren't out looking for the glory. But if you tap into that person, you're tapping into 25, 50, 100 other people, 
you know, and then they can help bring um, bring those others. And I've always said organizing is uh, the magic of one. So you're one person, you get another, then you're two. You each bring mm-hmm. one more person, then you're four. And so on. it doesn't take long until you have a movement. Yeah. And again, uh, the people, uh, you know, uh, I, I think I've talked to you about this before, Robert, and I know I've mentioned it on the air. But when I interview like somebody like Madonna Thunderhawk, who was at uh, Alcatraz, uh, she was at uh, Wounded Knee. She was at all the the uh, protests with uranium and the and the Black Hills, but you don't know that because she was behind the scenes taking care of business. And um, I asked her, you know, how did you get all this stuff done? And she, what she said, which was really interesting, which is kind of the opposite of my other job, and and I think maybe your job too, Robert, is is that how did she get so much done was that less people making decisions. So sometimes we have to herd cats, right? <laughs> right. Yep. Yep. And, and it, it's true. It's the, it's, it's easier if there are a few people, fewer people, right? Like uh, the, the, probably the easiest decision-making within government would be a dictatorship, right? One person <laughs> making all the decisions, but that doesn't necessarily best for all people. And so for me, the messy part, you know, is the good part. Uh, I used to say, well, I still say it actually sometimes when we're taking a controversial issue, an emotional issue out to the community, we know there's going to be uh, anger and emotion uh, expressed. And I always say, mobs carrying torches and pitchforks are my specialty. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. To me, people are speaking with passion and authenticity. And and yeah, maybe some of it's kind of hard to hear, but but how I feel about what you're saying is kind of secondary to the importance of you saying what you really believe. Right. And as a teacher, I really learned you can never, and it took me quite a few years to figure this out. You can never argue feelings because right. that's something personal and what they own. Right. Right. Yeah. I was just thinking about this today. I testified in a city council hearing around the appointment of the new city city of Minneapolis Public Works Director, the candidate is current MnDOT Commissioner Margaret uh, Anderson Kelleher, you know, a friend, someone I've worked with three years, think the world of. And so she asked me if I'd testify, and of course I, I did. But I just brought this back, because I've sat through hundreds, probably thousands of hours of public hearings in that kind of formal setting, you know, and I was always amazed at how eloquent people were that came to speak, people that never spoke in public, you know, they're shaking or whatever, but when they really tapped into their true feelings, man, they were always eloquent. Yeah, you know what that made me think of, uh, Robert? Uh, Wendy being a downtown city council and talking about uh, pet stores. Wendy, uh, do you remember that? Uh, That was pretty uh, powerful, and I know you were nervous, but you came off like a champ, and... um, because you were, you were speaking, you were speaking your truth. I brought a picture of our puppy mill dog Gracie in with me and held it, oh. and I stood behind before the city council members of St. Paul, um, and I pleaded with them to um, please vote on a humane pet store ordinance. Uh, and there were many people there who did that. Also, I think I was the last one to speak, hmm. and uh, it was really. I, I mean, I think my worst fear is speaking in public. It really is. And I was shaking and I was, my mouth was dry and mm-hmm. it was just awful. Uh, but I did, I did it for Gracie. And when you do it for something that you really feel so passionate about, um, you just do it. And I kept just saying, you know, be brave. This is not about you. This is for Gracie. And that's what gave me the, you know, strength to do it. That's beautiful, Wendy. Thanks for sharing that. And people, you know, people ask me sometimes, oh, does it make any difference? Does it really matter if we show up? And it matters. I mean, even if you're not going to speak, just having people that are going to be impacted by the decisions and actions that are being taken, sitting there looking at you while you're making those decisions, that matters. Well, yeah, you were on the other side of that, too, uh, as being a former city a council member yeah. to hear testimony like that. Yep, yep. Like I said, hundreds or maybe even thousands of hours of it. And I just respected it so much. Even, I just respected people, even if they were criticizing you directly or something. You know, they're speaking their truth. And and that's, that's how democracy is supposed to work. 
Right. And uh, it looks like Nina posted, it's not about one leader, it's about the people. And we mm -hmm. both have to, we have to degree, uh, agree with that for sure. You know, I, I, I don't know. I always enjoy our talks. Uh, it, we have a, a thing. We only have a couple minutes here, but it seems like we have some stuff rubbing up again here in Minneapolis with uh, our uh, police department. And I don't know, it's we need to see body cameras again, Robert. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, we'll see on this latest one. And so for folks who aren't in Minneapolis, there was a police shooting yesterday, right? Wow, it's not so long ago. And the police were serving a warrant and and someone ended up dead. And so uh, to me, the easiest way to dispel any suspicions of wrongdoing is to show the footage. Just show yeah. it. You know, I mean, we can do it in a respectful way that respects the life lost, but we got to see it. We got to. Right. Well, and then the, the, the thing that, you know, kind of turned me is that the warrant was not towards this person and this person that was shot is, was, uh, had a permit to carry. So the plot thickens and that's hope that, uh, the truth comes out quickly. So we don't, um, so we know. So we know. Right, right. Yeah, there's been a couple shootings in the metro area. The one in Ridgefield uh, earlier, it was at a school education center. And what was mm -hmm. particularly distressing is that in the early tweets that came out, people were saying that the two suspects were Native men and they ended up not being Native men. And, you know, it's a tragedy, whatever the racial identification, cultural identification is for the people. They happen to turn out to be Latino men. But it was just so quick. And every native that I know, as soon as that was going out on Twitter, were doubting that. You know, it's mm -hmm. like sort of the generic brown person. You know, the two guys happen to have long hair. So I guess I guess that right. was part of it. But they uh, yeah, instantly was like, oh, and two na the suspects are native, native men. So that was all disappointing. Yeah, it was. I'm glad you brought that up. A uh, uh, listener here, the Nate, that uh, chimes in once in a while. And uh, Nate, I just want to give you a shout out. Uh, I'm sorry your family has COVID, and I hope it's not severe. Seeing that you guys are uh, have been vaccinated, so uh, prayers are with you. But Nate messaged me and uh, and said that wanted to know about that from uh, Wisconsin because we're like in Wisconsin now too. So yeah, yeah um, it, it's hard. And the, I guess we can just put some tobacco down and, 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 uh, and pray that uh, things work out in a good way. You know, um, that's all we can do, but you know, our time is up here, Robert. And I really, you know, I really, really enjoy our conversations and we've Me had, you know, and we've been doing this over a year. Uh, we've been doing this two years at least. Uh, we were trying to wrangle you, uh, but you and your husband were going on some trip and we had to wait. And I don't know, was he blowing me off or was he really going to? Oh, never, never. And you've been on the show like two and a half years or even longer, I think, now that I think of it. Uh, but we really appreciate it. And having guests like you make this show, right, Wendy? And Absolutely. Mm, so kind. It's always a pleasure. Seriously, my pleasure. Right on. Hey, you're listening to Native Roots Radio Presents I'm Awake. And up next, uh, our sacred animal section with Wendy. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay with us. Hey, Olgama, I've been hearing a lot about this term, climate justice. What is that? Climate justice is recognizing that the negative impacts of climate change don't affect all people equally. It also means transitioning from a fossil fuel-based economy to a more sustainable future. MN350 is one of the groups that's pushing for this transition to protect our futures. You can even get involved, too. That's great, especially since I'm concerned about pipeline projects like Line 3. How can I help MN350? Just find them on Facebook or visit mn350.org. Minnesota has the only original wolf population in the continental United States, and 80% of Minnesotans believe the wolf should be protected. Howling for Wolves is asking Minnesotans to respect our true wildlife manager, the wolf. Their survival is critical to our ecosystems, our communities, and even our economy. As highly intelligent animals with strong social bonds, Minnesota wolves deserve to be protected and admired. Learn more at howlingforwolves.org. Let's live and let howl. The American Bison 
these powerful animals surround the weak members of the herd when threatened. I got vaccinated against COVID-19. To protect those who can't do it themselves. Me too. And me. Like the bison, we can protect those who can't help themselves. Get vaccinated today to stop the spread. Protect your herd. Brought to you by the McGizzy Communications and Minnesota Department of Health. Stay healthy this winter by protecting yourself, your family, and your community from COVID-19. Get a vaccine or booster. COVID-19 vaccines are safe, effective, and free and approved for everyone over the age of five. Wear a mask outdoors in crowds and indoor settings and lay low or get tested before visiting family and friends or attending events. To get more tips, schedule your vaccine or get tested, visit ramseycounty.us slash COVID vaccine. That's ramseycounty.us slash COVID vaccine. This is Winona LaDuke of Honor the Earth, and you're listening to Native Roots Radio. I'm awake. Welcome back to Native Roots Radio Presents. I'm awake, and this is Robert Pilot. This portion of the show is brought to you by Howling for Wolves, protecting wolves for future generations. How? How? You didn't bring up the wolf picture there, Robert. Wait, do it again. Whoa. Oh, there you go. Thanks for those wow. listening to us on, uh, see, watching us on Facebook. That's yeah. kind of fun that you kind of synchronized a uh, wolf howling on the screen. Yeah. Well, uh, again, you know, the pressure's on, Wendy. We've had a great show so far, and uh, now you're up. And but yeah, I don't want to mess it up. No, you won't. And um, shoot, you've uh, done our sacred animal section. We talk about this. This is our uh, fifth year uh, that mm. you've been doing this. And uh, I learned something new, and uh, and we have great sponsors like Howling for Wolves and uh, mm. people that are really out there doing their thing. So... Without any further ado, let's uh, get going, Wendy, and uh, talk to us about what you're going to talk to us about. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Hanaji Hihani. That means cares for them. I was given that name by my Dega, Curtis. And as always, Curtis, I know that you're listening because you commented earlier. So thanks again for that beautiful name. Uh, I am a Humane Policy Volunteer Leader for the Humane Society of the United States, and I work on animal issues at the local and state level. And it's always my pleasure to bring awareness to all kinds of different animal issues. So um, I found an article today, which I'm uh, is also good news. I've been trying to bring good news <laughs> every day here. So um, over 81,000 people called on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to establish stronger protections for endangered Mexican gray wolves. Uh, now, Mexican gray wolves are different from the wolves that we talk about up in the north. Um, and Mexican gray wolves are found elsewhere other than Mexico. They are found in Arizona and the southern states, and they are a little bit different. Um, the Mexican gray wolf, also known as Canis lubus bailey, or the El Lobo uh, of southwestern lore, is the most genetically distinct lineage of wolves in the western hemisphere. At only 25 to 32 inches tall, uh, the Mexican Mexican gray wolf is smaller than its cousin, the gray wolf, also known as Canis lupus. And that's, I usually talk about um, the larger gray wolf up in the north um, of the northern Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Northwest. Although their numbers have grown slowly, meaning the Mexican wolves, they remain the most endangered subspecies of wolf in the world because of compromised genetics human intolerance and reluctance to release more individuals uh, and bonded pairs to the wild, which is kind of sad. The organization that uh, called Defenders of Wildlife worked directly with ranchers and tribal members to implement proven techniques to keep wolves and livestock safe. And it sounds like 
you know, just reading what happens with the Mexican gray wolves is very similar to what happens here uh, with our northern gray wolves. Mexican gray wolves were once widespread from central Mexico throughout the southwest U.S. Uh, they have now been reintroduced to the southwestern Arizona in the Apache National Forest and may move into western New Mexico to the adjacent Gila National Forest forest as the population grows. Uh, they prefer habitats of mountain forests, um, scrublands, and grasslands. Um, so they are a little bit different than our northern wolves. Um, they look a little bit well, at least at this picture, for those watching us on uh, Facebook, they look a little smaller, which they are, and a little, I don't know, I don't want to say scrawnier, um, but uh, they, are, they are awfully cute. But over, like again, I said, uh, over uh, 81,000 people called on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to establish stronger protections for endangered Mexican gray wolves during a 90-day public comment period on proposed changes to a management rule that determines their recovery success, supporters of wolves returning to the northwestern U.S. submitted an estimated 81,000 comments. Over 47,000 were submitted through the regulations.gov site, uh, with another 34,000 individuals signing on to conservation organization letters submitted. Quote, Americans again voiced overwhelming support for science-based recovery of the iconic Mexican gray wolf. It is well past time for the Fish and Wildlife Service to listen. It is time for the symbol of the Southwest to once again roam free, said Patricia Estrella, uh, New Mexico's representative for defenders of wildlife. The comments consistently uh, referenced vital changes, and here are some of them. Uh, the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must designate wild Mexican gray wolves as essential. Since the, be since the beginning of reintroduction, wolves have been listed as non-essential, which must, must change immediately to give wolves the the legal protections they need to recover. Rather than trying to manage the Mexican wolf population around an average of 320 wolves, which will be inadequate to ensure resilience, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service should instead focus on establishing a larger meta population consisting of at least 750 wolves in at least three interconnected U.S. populations. There should not be a cap or a maximum number of Mexican wolves allowed in the wild. The best wolf scientists in the world say we need more wolves in more places to ensure long-term survival. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must do more to meaningfully and measurably address the genetic crisis faced by Mexican gray wolves. These are rare uh, wolves uh, and they need immediate genetic rescue that must be directly assessed, not by simply modeled. Genetic rescue can be best uh, be achieved through a combination of the release of well-bonded wolf families from the Mexican wolf species survival plan, captive breeding programs, along with cross-fostering of captive-born pups into wild packs. Relying on cross-fostering alone is ins insufficient. Further released wolves should uh, only count towards genetic objectives if they survive and reproduce in the wild as that is the only way to ensure that they have contributed their genes to the wild population. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service must do more work with partner agencies like the U.S. Forest uh, Service Department to require non-lethal prevention of conflicts between wolves and livestock to increase capacity for community outreach, to educate people about the presence of Mexican gray wolves and their protected status, uh, and to prevent wolf removal due to livestock conflicts as well as illegal killing. And this is what happens all the time, and it's happening the same with our nor northern wolves. 
Yeah. Wow. That uh, those uh, like the comments that we're seeing. They 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 look swell, not uh, scrawny. Uh, <laughs> I used the wrong I used the wrong word, but yeah, they are awfully uh, beautiful, and they're they're I think they're they're cute, but they are beautiful, um, and they're endangered. So we need to keep these animals uh, in the wild. Yeah, and they are our relatives. Let's not forget that. You know, mm -hmm. many tribes all over Turtle Island have clans, wolf clans, and we always talk about our lieutenant governor is from the wolf clan and her uh, her na nation and tribe. So, mm -hmm. uh, again, stellar work, Wendy. Couldn't do the show without you. I really appreciate you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I'd like to end with these thoughts. If you're listening to this program, you are part of the resistance from Chief Plenty Coops. The ground on which we stand on is sacred ground. It is the blood of our ancestors. We need to resist, divest, join a group, and run for office. You've been listening to Native Ritz Radio. Thank you, Robert Lilligren, Ogamon, of course, Wendy Pilot. We're still here. We are the seventh generation. Free Leonard Peltier. Stop line three. Please get vaccinated and boosted. Tune in for Philosophy Talk, a program that questions everything. Accept your intelligence.